All right, very good. So it's our Thursday, and we're looking at the last week of Jesus' life. And so uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, bless the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts. May they be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So I want to give you today a, a, the way in which this kind of gets messed up in our heads and in our minds when we talk about Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday. If I were to ask you about the events of the Lord's Supper on Thursday and the death on Friday, 99% of you would tell me that was two separate days. It is not. It's the same day. So let me explain. Anything that takes place after 6 p.m. is what? Already the next day. So, Thursday at 6 p.m. or after, if Jesus is having dinner, he's eating what meal? He's, he, no, he's, it's in the evening. But what meal is he eating? The, what were they preparing for for that Friday? Passover. Where am I going? So Thursday was let's prepare for the Passover. So they, they technically would have eaten the Passover on our Thursday night after 6, which would have been their Friday. So Jesus actually pulls an all-nighter because he has the Passover he teaches all night, goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, gets arrested, has false trials all overnight, then, then, then shows up to the Roman leaders in the morning once the sun rises, and he's crucified and he's done before sunset on Friday. Saturday he's in the tomb, right? Sunday starts our Saturday at 6 o'clock in the evening, and then he's resurrected that morning. So in reality, most of what we're most of what we're looking at would be a Jewish Friday. It would be the Passover. You realize they started in one day, went to bed, and woke up in the same day. We don't do that, right? We go to bed, wake up in a new day. They would actually go into their evening, which is starting the next day, go to bed, wake up, and still be in that same day. Do you see it? That's really important because really everything that we do Monday, Thursday, because it's our Thursday, and we do Good Friday because it's our Friday, but for Jesus, it would have been the same day. Does that make sense? All right, so let's, let's roll with that. <clears throat> so Luke chapter 22, verse 7, Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat it. This is happening on Thursday. Everybody agree? This part is happening on Thursday. Go prepare and get it ready. He says, Behold, when you enter the city, you're going to see a man carrying a jar of water, who will meet you, follow him. This is a lot like what day? This is a lot like Palm Sunday. Go into the city, you're going to see a donkey and it's cold. Untie them, right? He's Jesus is telling them exactly what they're going to find. You're going to find a man carrying a jar of water. How specific can you be? Right? I mean, you said it yesterday, how Jesus is in control. He's showing his divinity inside his humanity, and it's just screaming for those of us who are discerning enough to see it. And so, follow him into the house, which he enters, and tell him, the teacher says to you, where's the guest room where I am to eat? Do you, do you realize the, 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 the imperative here? Jesus isn't saying, can I? It's like saying, in the, when, I, when, I, when I talk to you about the donkey, what's the answer? The answer, it's Lord has need of it. Right? It's Lord. That donkey's Lord has need of it. Jesus is saying, you tell that man, where's the room where I am going to celebrate the Lord's Supper, the, 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 the Passover with you? And, and it says, where's the guest room? Where I'm going to eat the Passover with my disciples, and he will show you a large upper room. What? Furnished. Furnished. 
Just make it ready. Just get the meal prepared. It will already be furnished. Does that just like give you goosebumps? I mean, whoa. And they went and found it just as he had told them. All week long, it's been happening this way. All week long. And so you go to, and when the hour came, he sat at the table, and now, technically, we are probably in what? Friday. Friday. The very beginning of Friday. Somewhere during this meal, whether it started before, typically would not. You'd wait till the Passover started, then you'd have the meal. So we're actually going into Friday now, the sun setting, and he would be having the Lord's Supper there Friday evening, because it's evening and morning the first day. Verse 15, and he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat the Passover with you before I... He's being very clear, isn't he? Mm -hmm. By the way, when's that going to happen? Today. Today. I just want you to know, he knows he doesn't have another day. He knows it's happening today. Given that, watch what he's doing. Watch what he's doing. This is why the Lord's Supper is often called the last will and testament. It's his last will and testament. He is speaking truths before he dies, knowing that that's what's, what's coming. I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I tell you I shall never eat it again until its fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he divided among themselves. For I tell you that from now on I shall not drink the fruit of the vine until the kingdom. Remember the Passover meal had many stages. He's just, this is just in the beginning stages. And as uh, I think it was talked about by um, Tara at the meeting the, the other day, um, you can't picture the Lord's Supper like the pictures that you see that were, have been painted. You can't, it, it's not like they sit at tables like us. They recline, so their bodies would be laying, and they typically would lean on their elbow, and they would lean towards a table. And so you'd have one disciple that would be, would, could turn around and just see Jesus' face. You'd have another disciple on the other side that was kind of looking at the back of his head. And it would go around the table like that. Typically almost always shaped like a U. So servants could work on the inside. Does that make sense? Okay. A dispute arose among them about which of them was the greatest. On what day? On this day. On this day. And Jesus says, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over, over them call them benefactors, but not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become the youngest, and the leader as one who serves. For which is the greater, one who sit at, sits at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who sits at the table, but I am among you as one who serves? And we'll get to that in just a second. Jesus is saying, I have come to serve, although I deserve to be in the seat of honor. You are those who have continued with me in my trials. As my father appointed a kingdom for me, so do I appoint for you, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And now I would like you to turn to the Gospel of John. John chapter 13, and I'm going to go to my regular Bible because we're going to stay in John. By the way, notice, what chapter is it? John 13. Most of the book of John starts now. Do you realize that? Most people don't realize that. If John 13 is already talking about this moment, that means everything after is all covering one day. John is writing about the last day of Jesus' life. That's incredible, isn't it? So, what does Jesus do after that discussion about who is the greatest? He washes their feet. It was just before the Passover, Jesus knew that the time had come. The evening meal had been served. He takes off his outer, outer garment. 
He comes to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus said, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Why? He's the authority thing. Simon, then, then, then Lord, Simon, well, I'm sorry. Jesus then says, unless I wash you, you have no part in me. Now Simon rethinks and says, hey, douse me. Clean me, wash me, whatever you need to do, I'm in. And, and, and what I want you to understand, and I drew this for you yesterday, um, remember when we were describing the church and how it is hierarchically? So many churches call the church down here, and then the pastor or leader up here, right? What in wash? The question is, who's the greatest? That's what the disciples are asking. Who's the greatest? Jesus washes their feet. He's a servant. We pastors properly understanding our role is that we serve the church because it is the body of Christ. Right? And Jesus is proving it. He's proving it by washing their feet. Simon Peter said, not my feet, but my hands and my head as well. If it's about being connected to you, then I'm all in. And Jesus says, a person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. Right? The reference is Judas. He knows he's going to be betrayed. He knows everything about this day. He's in control of every moment of this day. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place and says, Do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord. And rightly so. Got it? I am the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You are right to give me that title. For that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. You realize the church should have never taken that kind of leap, that kind of a pick. Sin makes that happen. This text alone forces the church to be like this. Now that I've done it to you, you will do it for the rest of the time the church exists. Because they're becoming the pastors, right? Because they're becoming the pastors, and they're going to teach the next pastors, and they're going to right, and that's how I'm a pastor today. Connected to the work that those men did. You also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example so that you should do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth. No servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Then he predicts his betrayal. I'm not... Referring to all of you, I know those I have chosen, but this is to fulfill the scriptures. He who shares my bread has lifted up his heel against me. I'm telling you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am he. I tell you the truth. Whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me, and whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. And then Jesus became troubled in spirit. And I tell you the truth. One of you is going to betray me. The disciples are all wondering who it is, who it is, who is it? Verse 24, Simon uh, motioned to, to this disciple, to, to the one that Jesus loved, the one that was reclining next to him. That would have been on this side. Peter says to John, ask him. He's right there. Ask him, which one of us is it? Right? So, so you can see that you can see how that's working. And Jesus says, It is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot. And as soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. What you are about to do, do quickly. Jesus told him, but no one at the meal understood why Jesus said that to him. 
Since Judas had charged the money, some thought he was telling him to buy some necessities for the feast or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out, and it was what? Night. It was night. Not just outside. It was night in his soul. It was night in his soul. This is a tough day. So, I got to go back to this one. Hold on a sec. I closed it. Give me my page. All right. Now we insert from, let's use, let's use Matthew 26. Matthew 26, 26. We're going to insert now the Lord's Supper. <laughs> now as they were eating Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said take eat this is my body He took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the new what? Covenant. covenant. What the covenant's an Old Testament language, isn't it? It goes all the way back to Genesis 17 and 15, actually, <laughs> when God covenanted with Abraham. This is the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for many for the what? Forgiveness. For the forgiveness of sins. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You shall call his name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins so one of the things you know I don't want to go deeply into um, I don't want to go deeply into the, the the doctrine of the presence of the Lord in the sacrament but let's be clear about something there are two words for body in the Greek one is sarx and one is soma sarx means flesh sarx means Skin, hair, it means the fleshy stuff that you have on the outside of your body. Soma is a generic word for body. It describes body. It is, describes being. Because in the debates in the 16th century, Luther was accused of, uh, of cannibalism because of, his, uh, because of his understanding of the Lord's Supper. And, and this is where Luther got that infamous and famous phrase, in, with, and under the bread, the bread and wine, because they were trying to pin him as to where Jesus was. And he's going, you guys do not understand. I'm talking about a supernatural presence of the second person of the Trinity, in, with, and under the bread. And that sparked a whole bunch of issues. But no different than baptism. What you and I need to understand is the debate is less about what it is than what's done in it. Sacramental churches believe that in the sacraments, God is bringing grace down to recipients who need it. Non-sacramental churches believe they're participating in something to tell God that they're one with Him. It's their work. Sacramental churches believe God is working downward. Non-sacramental churches believe they're working upward. That's a critical difference. Mm -hmm. Regardless of what's there, that's important. Because we as a church believe that the means of grace are used and necessary because we're the ones in need and we need a God who comes to us in all sorts of forms. We need him to come in baptism. We need him to come in Lord's Supper. We need him to come in the Word. We need to come in music. We need to come in sermons. We need him to come. We need a God of grace who constantly comes. He's not much interested that we're coming to him all the time with anything because nothing that we can offer him is of any worth, right? He wants our hearts. And, and, so, and so he is now taking the Passover, which was a celebration. Remember, a lamb would have its neck slit and the blood of that lamb would be put on the door frame of the house. And because that lamb sacrificed its 
life and that blood was on the doorpost of the house, the angel of death bypassed those houses and their firstborn did not die. If the blood was not there, a firstborn died. It was the only way to escape that judgment, that plague. It was God's grace. It was his way of protecting the faithful. Right? And so, how true it is that Jesus, the Lamb of God, his blood is shed. And we are covered with his blood so that the angel of death has no power over us and that we have the certainty of life and eternal life because of what his, he has done. His blood, blood was shed once for all so that we could be eternally forgiven. No longer a need for annual you know, practices. We actually can celebrate the meal at any time and all times because we get to participate not just in this, but he gives the hint that this is a heavenly meal. This, is a, this will be representative of a meal that we partake on in heaven. So, with that, let me let, let me just let me go on and say, uh, back to John chapter uh, thirteen, verse thirty-one. He now predicts Peter's denial. I, 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 Jesus knows this is the last. He knows everything. He's now telling Peter what's going to happen in just a few hours. He is he is preparing the the, the disciples he loves. He's he's reaching out to them. And he says to Peter, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself, and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you, where I'm going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you. <coughs> Love one another. When Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment is, he said what? Love God with all your heart, mind, soul. Love your neighbors yourself. He's now telling them, I'm going to be leaving you. Don't you ever forget what I told you was the greatest commandment. Don't you ever forget. This is him laying all the things that he can lay out because this is nearly the last time that they will see him face to face. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Do you realize just the way you love might be a way in which someone who is unchurched would be attracted to the church because you represent a love of Jesus that they are not used to? Is that verse 35? Uh, verse 35. 34 and 35. No, I'm back to John 13. Sorry, hon. <laughs> Verse 36, Simon Peter said, Lord, where are you going? Lord, where are you going? Jesus says, where I'm going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. <coughs> You're going to have to go a similar path. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus says, will you really lay down your life for me? I tell you the truth, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Peter has no idea this is going to happen in a few hours. He has no idea. This is, it is incredible that Jesus is preparing him this way. And then he says to all of them, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas says, Lord, we do not know where you're going. So how can we know the way? And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. You, if you really knew me, you would know the Father as well. For now on, you do know him and have seen him. Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough. What do you mean when we've seen you, we've seen the Father? Show us the Father, and that's good enough. Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you so long? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Take your Jehovah Witness friends right here. 
Don't battle John, John 1. And they can't change all the verses in Scripture. <laughs> so they put an A in there. Jesus is a God. And so I said, okay, skip that one. Let me take it to 37 other places. <laughs> but you see him pleading with Philip? He's going, I don't have much time, Philip. Come on. When you see me, you've seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my, are, are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say to you that I am in the Father and the Father, you, you, you know this section. But he is just telling them that we're one. Verse 15, if you love me, you will obey what I command and I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor to be with you, the spirit of truth. That's good news. I'm going to leave you, but the reason why I'm leaving you is because another one is going to come. The one who's going to come is going to be the Spirit. So you're not going to be left alone. Everybody, the doctrine of the Trinity is in this section. We just did it. We just did it. I'm going back to the Father, and we're sending the Spirit. And he's also the Spirit of what? Of truth. From the rooted ministries. Our mission statement? To firmly root God's people in his eternal truth. truth. Because they're eternal and they're true. The word cannot the world cannot accept him because it is neither sees him or knows him, but you know him, for he lives what? He lives with you and will be and will be in you. He's already talking to them about Pentecost. He's already talking about the Holy Spirit descending upon them and being in them. I will not leave you as an orphan. I'm not going to leave you alone. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live. You also will live. I'm going to live. And because I live, you will live. He's already talking about the resurrection. On that day, you will realize that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him. Um, what do we have here? Well, da, 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 da. I wanted to jump to... Verse 25. I wanted to get the counselor what the Holy Spirit's job is. All this I have spoken while still with you... But the Counselor of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. What he's saying is, your education is not done. I have taught you what you need to this point. The Holy Spirit will come and he will continue your education. We should expect that the Holy Spirit is teaching us. And that has been teaching the church for 2,000 years. And should continue to teach and guide the church in the direction that it, that it should move. will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Well, that's good. Right? The Holy Spirit is going to remind you of these things. How do you think they wrote them down? How do you think John wrote his gospel? Somebody had to remind him. Right? The Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit. God, the Holy Spirit reminded them, supernaturally even, reminded them what he said what his teachings were. How do these guys read, tell us the parables so accurately? Because the Holy Spirit is reminding them. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Verse 15. Ha, the vine and the branches. I'm the true vine. And my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. And so you have this whole idea of remain in me and I will remain in you. Verse five, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit and apart from me, you can do nothing. nothing apart from me. There's only two options. You either are abiding in Jesus Christ or you are not abiding in Jesus Christ. There's, this is not a spectrum. See, we like spectrums, Jesus likes black or white. You are for me or against me. 
either you are yes or no. Lukewarm, I spew you out of my mouth. I don't like that. Right? Verse 9, as the Father has loved me, so I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's <coughs> command and remain in his love. Uh, verse 12, my command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Are you guys hearing a point? He's now pounding them that love has to be the core of everything they do. Love has to be the core. Grace has to be the core of everything they do. Verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in, in my name. This is my command. Love each other. Then he says the world's going to hate them, that they're going to be persecuted in, 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 in the second half of chapter 15. Verse 16, all this I've told you so that you will not go astray. They will, uh, 16, John 16, verse 1. All this I have told you so that you will not go astray. They will put you out of the synagogues. In fact, a time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he's offering a service to God. Who's that? Paul, right? But today, ISIS. But Paul, Paul, right? Before his conversion, he was destroying Christians' homes, killing Christians, thinking he was doing God a favor. Verse 3, they will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this so that when the time comes, you will remember that I warned you. I do, I do not tell you this at first because I was with you. And then he goes on to some more teaching about the Holy Spirit. Now I'm going to him who sent me. Yet none of you ask me where are you going because I have said these things. You are filled with grief. But I tell you the truth. It is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. In regard to sin, because men do not believe in him. And me, in regard to righteousness, because I'm going to the Father, where you can see me no longer. In regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Boom. Satan's finished. Holy Spirit is going to take on from here. Holy Spirit is going to be the mover of everything that you do. Everything that church accomplishes will be a move of the Holy Spirit. So I need to leave so he can do his thing. Yes. This might be a really dumb question, but I'm hoping I'm not the only one thinking it. So when Jesus returns in the upper room, and is he not the Holy Spirit at that time then? He's just along with it when he returns? Or is he not understanding at this point that he will be the physical representation of the Holy Spirit when it comes? Say, say that one again. When Jesus comes, after whatever it is, the 40 days or whatever, I don't remember how many days. It's one of the Sundays of Lutheran celebrate. I haven't been Lutheran long enough to remember. <laughs> <laughs> but he comes and re-meets the 12 and I don't know how often all And that's when the Holy Spirit is brought upon them. It's not resurrection. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but in that section... It, it, there, there are about four or five times that Jesus pops on the scene after his resurrection, and he's with the guy, with them, and then he disappears. One of those right. moments, he breathes on them and says, receive yeah. the Holy Spirit, right? And, and, and what that is is a transference. What it is is because they're Trinity, right. there's an exchange happening. And so what happens on Pentecost, 50 days after that, what happens on Pentecost is the Holy Spirit crashes into that room, it shakes, the wind's blowing, and tongues of fire end up on their heads, and now, now we're in the age of the Holy Spirit. Today, we are still in the age of the Holy Spirit. It's not, it's not that one, it, it's the different roles of the Trinity, right? The Jesus, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, he's going to return on the last day, and there he is. The most amazing thing, you can, it's hard to argue yourself out of the Trinity if you really read the Bible. It's, it's, you have, it's hard to, to not believe in a triune God. So, so they are two separate persons that are, that's clearly distinguished when Jesus says, receive the Holy Spirit, and then breathes on them. And there is this connotation that as God breathed into Adam and made him a living soul, I now am breathing into you that which is going to take you into your next place, your next roles, fulfilling your purposes. 
Tom? Yes. What's so interesting to me is that largely in this day and age, we really only focus on Jesus and the Father. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't, you know, a lot of people don't really know think about the Holy Spirit. Yet here, Holy Spirit's the whole deal. And I got to tell you that, that that in my whole seminary training, in my in my first ten years as a pastor, I can tell you that this is not this is not taught, this is not emphasized. Mm -hmm. What is the age of the Holy Spirit? What should we expect? Mm -hmm. uh, it's not because because you're so drilled with the fact that we're a cross-centric church and we got to look at the, the object of justification of the salvation. You know what I mean? It's all focused. It's not like my phone. What are you doing with my phone, Bill? Does that make sense? Yeah, but think about the power that the church could have today if we recognized this. Well, or, or just take a snapshot of a ministry that was 30 years ago and a ministry that is now and believes something completely new about the Holy Spirit, right? Firmly rooted ministries is, is I think, unique in comparison to Lutheran churches around the country. There's going to be something that is going to be really interesting to watch. Um, for some of you, uh, you, you, oh, I've got so much to do. Um, <laughs> I hear the term non-denominational church. You know, there is no such thing. There is no such thing as a non-denominational church. What people do is they flew away from their, not their denominational title because they wanted to remove themselves from a stigma of what those, those churches are. We're not like those churches, those Baptist, Catholic, Lutheran, Presbyterian. We're not like those churches. We're like this. Well, doggone it. Your pastor went to one of those seminaries. <laughs> <laughs> but my dream, my dream, is that what if, what if one of those old, stodgy, doctrinal churches could find a New Testament understanding of the work of the Holy Spirit and could ignite a fire? And if that could happen, could that then jump to another stodgy church and jump to another stodgy church? And could all of a sudden these stodgy churches that nobody wants to be a member of because they're bad, they're all of a sudden filled with the Holy Spirit and doing amazing things because you know what? They've been the church for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousand years. You know what I mean? And so I, I just, that, that's just a side, side, side note. Um, <laughs> so now we have the work of the Holy Spirit. I have much more to say to you, verse 12, more than you can bear. But when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all. Verse 12 and 13. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all. If you're uncertain what to do, who do you ask? It makes sense to me. If you're wanting to know what's true. I mean, you pray directly to Jesus, right? You pray directly to the Father. How often do you pray directly to the Holy Spirit? See, we don't teach it, do we? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're all three persons of the Trinity. You're not wrong to pray to the persons of the Trinity, especially when you are claiming their values. Not their values, their characteristics. Holy Spirit, you are the giver of truth. Holy Spirit, we need your truth. We need your dis discernment. We need your wisdom. Right? Our Lord Jesus Christ asked us and told us to be assured that you would provide these things. Please bring them to us. That's a proper use of the Trinity in prayer. All right. He tells them that their grief is going to turn to joy in verse 17. A little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me. Like three days. Um, <laughs> because I'm going to the Father. Um, let's see, I wanted to jump to chapter 17. I know I'm skipping stuff, but i got to hit the high points. 17 is Jesus' high priestly prayer. If you've never read 17, I want you to realize that Jesus has been talking to who? Yeah, this isn't a crowd. Remember, they went from the upper room, and now they're traveling to the Garden of Gethsemane, right? Because that's where they're, they're going to arrest him. So he's traveling from the upper room to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's teaching, 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 teaching. It's believed that maybe right now he's reached the garden. Because we know in the garden he did what? He prayed. So it would make sense that he's praying. Right? Look what he prays for. 
Father, the time has come. Glorify your son, that your son may glorify you. I mean, we're talking, he's within an hour or two of him being arrested. For you granted him authority over all people that he might have give eternal life to all those who have been given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me. I've had a job to do, and I'm completing it now. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Remind me of this. Remind me of this. Keep this before my eyes. I, reve I have revealed you to those whom you gave me, the disciples, right? They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you, for I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world. Look at that. He made a separation. I'm not praying for the world right now. But for those you've given me, I'm praying for this new young church, these, these, these disciples. For they are yours. All I have is yours. And all you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world. And I'm coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them by the power of your name. There's power in the name of Jesus. There's power in the name of God and Yahweh, Elohim. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe. What kept them safe? Jesus did. Do you think that maybe religious leaders wanted to kill them and Jesus at other times? Certainly. Jesus, Jesus protected them. His presence alone. I protected them and kept them safe by the name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that the scripture will be fulfilled. I'm coming to you now. But I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I've given them your word, and the world has hated them. For they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They got a job to do, and they're going to be in ministry. And they're going to be attacked. I need you to protect them while they go do their work. I need you to protect them. While they proclaim your name, I need you to, I'm not asking you to pull them out of the world and so they don't face trouble. I'm asking you to protect them in the midst of it. Right? If you think about it, I've always told you the church is a rescue ship. Right? When everyone else is pulling their boats to the shore and tying them up, we are supposed to be the boat that's going into the wind, into the storm. We are supposed to be the boat that's going into the storm. Finding those who are lost, finding those who are, 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 are down and redeem and save them. That's our job. Not to go the same current the world's going, but go against it. They're not of this world, even as I am not of this world. Sanctify them by your truth. What's the only thing that can sanctify a life? Truth. Who gives truth? The Holy Spirit. You see the connections. That's why he's also called the sanctifier, because he guides us into all truth. Our lives change when we're in a relationship with him. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctified, for them I sanctified myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. Then he says, interestingly enough, my prayer is not for them only. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. Who's that? He just prayed for you hours before he died. I'm not just praying for these 11 or 12 or the 150. I'm not just praying for them. I'm praying for anyone and everyone who, because of their message, for the next 2,000 years plus, is hitting that same storm. I'm praying for them, too, that all of them may be one. What's what? Homothumadon. That all of them may be one, not divided, not separated, not all doing their own thing, but they might be one, because there's power in one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I've given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be as one as we are one. 
I and them and you and me, may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know. You realize our unity is what's supposed to have an impact. Our love and our oneness should be a powerful proclamation to a world that knows nothing but division. How is it that you do that? How is it that you can be a body that's one? How do you love the way you do? How come you don't have divisiveness? How come you don't have those kinds of things? That should draw people's interest. Verse 18, we have the arrest. I'm sorry, chapter 18. When he had finished praying, is it, do I want to be here yet? Nope. I need to go to my other one because we're not in the, we got to get to the, where's this course? Second discourse. Third discourse. Intercessory prayer. Oh, great. Now I want you to go to um, Matthew 26. Matthew 26. Why? Because John doesn't record the activity in the Garden of Gethsemane. So... You see why the synoptic <coughs> is important to put together? You cannot get a complete picture without looking at all of them. Why is that? What's that? Why is it? Why, why are we? We're skipping back from book to book. Why is it you said the Holy Spirit came down upon them? Why are they? And often through the Bible, the stories are flipping back between the two, all the writers. Why is it the Holy Spirit? Why are there different accounts of the same situation? Well, or one covers something and, does, and, and, and it's not covered by another, right? Um, uh, I think it's John that doesn't even have the Lord's Supper in it. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke do. It depends on the writer's intent. Who they're writing to. There are certain things that wouldn't make sense to write to somebody that you're writing to. And so he, he intentionally leaves it out. It's, it's not a mistake to leave something out. It's a, it's a mistake to say something wrong. So John never says something wrong. He just leaves certain things out no differently than, I mean, John doesn't talk about Jesus' life in the early part, his, his birth or anything. He just says the word became flesh. How different is that? I mean, because John's writing a theological dissertation. He's writing a different kind of book than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Luke's trying to write an account of Jesus' life. Let me tell you from way in the beginning. Here's Elizabeth, and here's Zechariah, and here's John the Baptist, and here's how it all happened. John's not trying to do that. John's trying to tell you that Jesus is life, light, way, truth, living bread, living water. He is trying to theologically tell you who Jesus is. Why? Because his audience is different. John's audience is different. Holy Spirit still blessed each man writing in his own style. You my second question. <laughs> I'm on a roll. So uh, 2630, and when they had sung a hymn, they're, uh, they're out at the Mount of Olives, and then go to verse 36. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, a section of the, the Mount of Olives. And he said to his disciples, sit here. Sit here. And in Luke, I'm not going to have you jump there, but Luke says, pray that you may not enter, enter into temptation. Right? Pray that you may not enter. Jesus knows Satan is close. Jesus knows Satan is the enemy. Is, I mean, he knows that the movie, the movie that What's His Face did about the, 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 the passion, this is some areas where I think he depicted it wonderfully as Satan is in the garden and that slithering snake is, is, is and he's sweating dr great drops of blood. This is huge. <coughs> and I think he depicts it perfectly until finally it's boom. And Jesus is steadfast. It's time, right? And you're going to find the disciples sleeping, right? He keeps going back to them, and they're sleeping. It's all spiritual. It's spiritual darkness, spiritual this stuff going on. Jesus is alone in the Gethsemane. He's, it, this is the beginning of the separation. This is the beginning of bearing that which we deserve. This is, this is huge stuff going on. And while I... While I go over there, I'm going to pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons, James and John, happens to be the same guys who went on a mount of transfiguration. And he began to be greatly distressed. 
And he says, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch with me. This is a very different Jesus than what's just there, that was just with them a half hour ago. Can you, can you feel it? Can you feel that the whole mood has changed? Everything has changed. They've gotten to the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus is no longer teaching. He's suffering. And he's never suffered before, not in front of their eyes. They've never experienced Jesus go through anything like this. And he's asking them to pray for him. That everything is, I gotta imagine these guys are going, what is going on? They're feeling this eeriness. They're feeling this eeriness. And, and Jesus is eerie. And everything he's saying is now eerie. And it's all kind of weird. Isn't this where he's kind of beginning to take all of our sin on? Not yet, but it's getting close. It's getting close. He knows the arrest is coming. And then everything after that is going to be really hard. My soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And Jesus fell on his face. Jesus fell on his face. I mean, I've fallen on my face when I was hopeless, when I had no clue what to do next. Jesus, Jesus, you fell on your face? What in the world is going on? What in the world is going on? Father, the word Abba, all things are possible with you. Take this cup away from me. Take this cup away from me. But not my will. Yours be done. Take this, take this cup away from me. What's the cup? The, the cup of God's wrath <clears throat> being poured out completely. Upon Jesus instead of us. That's called the vicarious atonement. He bears what we will never have to. He comes to his disciples and he finds them sleeping and he says to Peter, Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Highlight that word, highlight that phrase. That's true for every single one of us. <laughs> our spirit is willing, but our flesh is weak. That's why we got to be firmly rooted in his words so that we can give some oomph to our flesh. We've got to give some oomph to our flesh. And he goes away praying again, Father, if this can't pass unless I drink it, thy will be done. And again he comes to his disciples, and they're sleeping. Their eyes are heavy. They don't even know how to answer him now. They, every time he comes back, they're trying to stay awake, but they can't stay awake. Jesus is alone. He, he, is, he is going through his trauma Dropping great drops of blood, he's sweating. So leaving them again, he went away praying a third time, saying the same words. Then he came back to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping? Are you still taking your rest? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See my betrayers here. What About what time of night would you say this is probably happening now? Like eight, nine o'clock at night or later? Well, later, because he did all that teaching while they were walking to Gethsemane. So this is probably midnight. Oh. This is probably midnight. So that, I've always, until you even explain the <clears throat> six o'clock and the next day, I've always put this as like in the morning or something. Right, it's not I know. Why they're sleeping, they're tired. Exactly. Yeah. It's been a long three days. Because I'm sitting there thinking, how how in the world can you sit in there be sleeping when this is and it's like oh, we're tired. <laughs> <laughs> so then if, if you would if you would then go to um, um, John eighteen. John eighteen. Now we're in the right place. And I only got a couple minutes. Um, at least for the video. How much video has, has happened? All right, six minutes. Okay. Um, <laughs> when he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidder Valley. Um, now Judas, verse 2. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the olive grove. 
guiding a, dis, uh, a detachment of soldiers and some officials with chief priests and Pharisees, and they were carrying torches and lanterns and weapons, Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, Jesus, knowing all of it, went out to them, took the initiative before anything bad would happen, and says, who do you seek? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. He says, I am he, Jesus said. And Judas the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Just grab it. Grab the moment. Soldiers with lanterns and swords just fell to the ground because Jesus spoke a word. How powerful is the word of God? I love being a preacher. I got the greatest weapon in the world. Again, he asked them, who do you want? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth, I told you that I'm he. If you're looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words were spoken that I have not lost one of those who you gave me. Then good old Simon pulls out a sword, drew it, struck the high priest, servant, cutting off his ear, because he's all in. Right? He's all in. And Jesus says to Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? You don't, you, you, you don't understand. I'm in control. I'm not losing control, Peter. I don't need you to be in control right now. I'm really going to wish that you were in control in about three hours. <coughs> then the detachment of soldiers took him. He heals the guy's ear, as you know. And then the trial begins. And I'm going to stop the video. and Because we got to be at... An hour?